I think many people have feel that we've experienced a watershed moment in, in AI with industrial models such as ChatGPT and DALI and others. And unfortunately, I see a lot of anguish, especially among some of the, the graduate students, that maybe academia just can't compete with the resources in industry, especially in terms of scale of the input data, in terms of scale of the compute clusters, and the scale of the engineering teams. And this really gives me a deja vu moment, or deja vu as I say, uh, because I was a PhD student 25 years ago in computer graphics when that field also experienced a watershed moment with uh, movies such as Jurassic Park and Toy Story. And really, uh, you know, this is the kind of image I was able to produce during my PhD. Don't, don't laugh, because you know, industry could do this kind of images at the same time and five years before, they could do images like that. And really, it was hard for academia to compete with the scale of industry, both in terms of the input models, in terms of the compute clusters, and in terms of the engineering teams. So what did academia do? Did they just give up or try to catch up with industry? Of course not. They just explored radically different ideas, and they moved the field forward. And so for context, um, you have to realize that at the time, industry was all about artistic control. They kept telling us that they didn't care about physical realism. They didn't want lighting simulation. They didn't want simulation of motion or anything. They just wanted the artist to be able to tell the story and control every single thing that was going on the screen. And meanwhile, in academia, people were exploring the very thing that industry was telling us was not useful. People were looking at numerical algorithm for lighting simulation, for uh, fluid and clothes simulation, and all sorts of other crazy ideas like appearance models for hair, skin, uh, even machine learning for animation. And you know, fast forward today, rendering and production is essentially entirely based on these algorithms for lighting simulation that were pioneered in academia decades before. You know, people use Monte Carlo pass tracing, hair and skin appearance models, et cetera, et cetera. Really, industry has completely adopted these crazy ideas from academia. If you look at something like graphics hardware, the same thing happened. The industry was focused on fixed function hardware that was using so-called rasterization algorithms. And people in academia were exploring completely different things. Um, hardware that can support ray tracing, uh, hardware that's programmable. And uh, people even had this crazy idea that maybe you could run computation on the GPUs, not just render images. And of course, all these ideas are now fundamental to modern graphics hardware, and in particular to uh, running general computation and GPUs, which really powered the, the recent deep learning revolution. One thing I'll, I'll point out is that um, academia has really pushed the mathematical foundations of computer graphics, which has really made the field stronger. And these mathematical underpinnings are now at the heart of practical tools that are used in industry today. All these lighting simulation, fluid, closed simulation, they're really based on very strong mathematical model that originated in academia. Of course, this is a talk by an academic, so I have to do some self-promotion. One example I was lucky to be involved in is a compiler called Halide that makes it very easy to write high-performance code for image processing in particular. It's largely the work of Jonathan Ragan Kelly and Andrew Adams, who are here in the picture. And I will argue that you know, we were able to have more impact than similar projects in industry because we were able to step further away from existing practices. In particular, we gave much more control to the programmer than what people doing in traditional compilers. And also, we open source the compiler. It was eventually picked up by people in industry, in particular at Google and, and Adobe, who really made it industrial strengths, and now it's used very heavily uh, for things like YouTube, uh, the Android camera app, Google Photos, Photoshop, uh, even Facebook uses it for, for, for some of PyTorch. Um, and really, I think this impact was possible only because we started in academia. 
And interestingly, of the two people who worked on this project, uh, who were grad students and, and postdocs respectively at the time, one of them decided to continue his impact in academia. Jonathan is now on the faculty here. And Andrew decided to pursue his impact in industry at Adobe. And really, uh, it's making us stronger. We're still a happy family and working together um, and benefiting from the synergies between academia and industry. I think in the next talk, uh, Bill Freeman will tell you about some of the joint work that we did that I think also could only have been done in, in academia because we, we were looking at crazy things that nobody else was interested in, amplifying motion and changes in video. So don't, don't get me wrong, uh, industry also played a huge role in the ideas that power computer graphics today, but I, I would argue that many of the groundbreaking work that was done in industry in graphics was done in the 1980s, uh, back when the field was not widely accepted in academia. And I will also argue that a lot of the paradigm shifting work that's been done in industry by people like Yostam, for example, at Alias Wavefront, uh, was done maybe despite being in industry rather than thanks to the resources of industry. And academia is not perfect either. Academia has a lot of blind spots. As I said, uh, graphics wasn't widely accepted in universities until maybe the 1990s. Some real world issues get ignored all the time. And there's sometimes a herd mentality for just incremental work on the topic that everybody's working on. So what are the lessons of this historical precedent? Uh, I think the main one is that you've got to think long term. You've got to work on something different, something new. Uh, step back, you know, are we asking the right questions? Are we working on the right problems? Take time to explore and don't worry about field boundaries and whether something belongs to a field or not. Develop theory and understanding of what's going on. Learn skills and techniques outside the mainstream of your field. Learn about the real world, but don't let it constrain you. And try to see change before everyone else, of their nascent capabilities, of their shifts of bottlenecks or resources, of their exponentials happening that will change how the field works. Find and focus on your strategic advantage, always uh, a good strategy. Uh, work in small teams, be nimble. And I, I really want to highlight something that, that many people have been doubting, uh, I, I fear, is that the natural order of things is for academia to pioneer ideas and for industry to refine them and further engineer them, not the other way around. We should really be the ones defining the new ideas. I think graphics has also shown something that's really important, which is systems, both engineering systems like software engineering, uh, but also intellectual system, you know, ways of organizing your ideas. I think that's one thing that's currently lacking in, in, in AI. And I think as, as I hope I've illustrated through Halide, uh, open sourcing your work really magnifies your impact. And finally, I want to conclude with maybe the most important lesson of all. I think that there should be no anguish about the current situation. Uh, the state of the field is very exciting, both the field of graphics and the field of AI. And I think everyone should really focus on having fun and enjoying the moment. Thank you.